Hello, everyone out there in Facebook land. It is I, Susan Gerbic, and Janice Boynton, and we're joined today with Mark Edward. Um, please, <laughs> please join us <clears throat> in conversation on Facebook. We will be taking your questions as we go today. Also, hello to everyone on YouTube who are watching this video after the after it has been cleaned up and added to YouTube. We are. Um, this is in conversation. Uh, about time project please like us on facebook uh, the about time project facebook page as well as subscribe to us on youtube i will warn you that i am going to be able to see uh, just a few of your comments from time to time as they come up on the live feed on my right hand side which is why i'm looking away at times and it, we will uh, take questions as we go Today we're going to be talking, this is a continuing conversation about facilitated communication and rapid prompting method. And we have done a series, Janice and I, on, uh, on lots of the different methods of facilitated communication, the history of facilitated communication, what's wrong with this, you know, how is it a harm? Uh, we've talked about language, we've talked about the law, we've talked about a lot of different things. Um, but today we're going to talk about the idiomotor effect, uh, the Ouija board effect, Clever Hans, uh, some of the different other methods that a mentalist or somebody in the, um, the world that Mark Edward is involved in. The entertainment world. <laughs> it's nothing entertainment about this. So um, I'm going to send this over to Janice to give us a little update on uh, what we're going to be uh, facilitating communication, introduce yourself, and then Mark, if you'll introduce yourself, that'd be great. Okay. okay. Um, I am a former facilitator and um, have learned that facilitated communication, which is a technique that's being currently used for people who have severe communication um, difficulties, people with autism, developmental disabilities, that kind of thing, cerebral palsy. Um, it's actually not a, a communication device at all, but it's actually the facilitators who are doing the communicating. So that's why we started this series. And um, uh, we're not really going to be talking a whole lot if you if you're not if you're new to facilitated communication. <clears throat> like Susan said, we've got plenty of videos that um, show examples of what it is. Um, what's interesting to me is that. Um, facilitators often don't understand why it is that FC kind of quote unquote works. Um, they're really unaware of the, the physical and some of the psychological uh, tech, you know, technicalities with it. So that's part of the reason why we have Mark here today to explain that um, a little bit more about the magic behind facilitating <laughs> communication. Hi, I'm Mark Edward. Uh, I have been involved with uh, mentalism and uh, facilitated communication on a level that is not clinical at all. Uh, it has been tagged in my universe as part of being an entertainment. It is uh, a scientific fact uh, that is everybody who is in the mentalism community knows more or less what's going on with it. And they also know how powerful it can be uh, because the idiomotor response is something that is so subtle that it really is the closest thing to real mind reading that you can get to if you start to study it and you start to understand how the muscles uh, in your body and uh, the way it's connected to the mind, how it can be uh, su suggested. And once a suggested, is, uh, suggested paradigm is uh, conditioned into somebody, which only takes about two or three minutes, they can, because they want to help and they want to see the outcome, just like any other psychic thing, they will take the ball and run with it. And at that point, you are tapping into, some people say their unconscious side, other people say it's it's just a muscle thing. It's very subtle. It's how a Ouija board works. Uh, and it can be, to the outsider who doesn't understand the science behind it, it can be miraculous. So I'm here because I feel like there is a bridge between what facilitated communicators are doing and what goes on between a psychic entertainer 
and their sitters at a, in a seance or in any sort of psychic reading, there's there's a bridge there that is uh, not real, and uh, it it's it seems real, but it it's conditioned it's a conditioned response, and it is set up by the facilitator. So that's why I'm here. Okay, so one of the things I wanted to mention is that this goes way back to when I was a little girl where when we were in elementary school, somebody would put something on a string, like this pendulum. I've got mine right here. And uh, there was all kinds of games we used to play where we would say, um, what is the name of the boy we're gonna marry? How many children we're gonna have? That kind of thing. And somebody would make it up. They'd say, if it swings back and forth, it means yes or no. If it swings around to the side and circles, then it means something else. I know for a fact that I was moving the darn thing because you know you moved it to be whatever boyfriend or whatever boy you had a crush on and you would move it. And this has been something that um, I've known about since I was a little girl. But recently I was watching a video. I thought everybody knew this is just silly, right? And I was just recently watching a video of, um, it's one of these murder um, dramas that's, that's really happening, it's a real story. But anyway, so they interviewed this guy and he said, oh, I knew he was the real deal. He was a real man from God because he even pulled out a pendulum one day and he was using, he was saying, yes or no and you know and he was talking to god and i thought you're an adult i mean you're like in your 30s or 40s how could you not know that this is a child's game that you are just playing and i was i was shocked to say the least and should i tell the chicken breast story yeah, tell the chicken breast story <laughs> <laughs> and i've heard this from more than one other person they've seen this happen to by the way uh, many years ago when I had my little collection of pendulums and I was uh, intensely learning from some of the best people in, in the, the mentalist world, uh, Robin DeWitt, who was also, his name was Cardor. Cardor. Cardor, the, the mentalist. Uh, he had a great business card that says mentalism and balloons. I mean, he was... <laughs> nice. He was, he was funny, goofy, <laughs> one of my best pals, but he also was one of the best adherents to what a pendulum does. Anyway, I, I digress. So one day I'm in uh, Mrs. Mrs. Goose's health food market in uh, Gooch's, that was it, in Santa Monica. And I walked by the uh, where the butcher uh, meat department was and there was a woman, there was three chicken breasts on wax paper on top of the counter and here is this woman using her pendulum to go over each one oh no the three chicken breasts and i will never forget the look on the butcher's face he was just like <laughs> pick one already apparently, yeah it pit pick one you know but he's obviously seen this woman before he didn't look surprised at all so and then i heard from somebody else recently that they saw the exact same thing so People put a lot of faith in it. They really do. They, it's how they, they, it's just like somebody who reads a horoscope before they get out of bed in the morning and they say, oh no, I'm, I better not go out of the house or whatever, or take a bath today, or whatever it is. So Susan, I, you know, I beg to differ, you know, you may have been advanced at a, a young age, oh. but... <laughs> Pendulums have been around a long time, and you know they used to be called the birth detector. Is it going to be a male or a female? And mm -hmm. you know, I've heard of that. It's gotten me out of tight spots that I will maybe have time to go into. Oh, tell it, tell it. I know what you're going to say. Go ahead. Well, it has to do with the conditioning, just like just like the facilitator and FC and the and the way that they have their first appointment and they lay down the foundation with e either the parent or, the, you know, with the, with the parent, basically, I, I would assume, and the child is brought into the picture. Uh, it, is, it, is a, uh, it is a conditioning reflex that can be monitored by somebody who, who knows what they're doing. Now I forgot the story I was gonna oh, tell. Oh, you're gonna tell the story how you got out of tight spots. 
Oh, yeah. When I was doing the preparation for writing my book, Psychic Blues, I did a lot of parties, celebrity parties, mostly. With They were high-end, I'm happy to say. They were movie stars and people who were writers in Hollywood. It, it, was a, it was a good group to work with because the higher you are up on that the ladder, the celebrity ladder, the more superstitious you can be. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not painting with too broad a brush to say that, you know, people carry a, a, a rabbit's foot or a poker chip or something that they think brings them luck. Anyway, a lot of times I would get into a situation where I would have a sitter sitting across from me and they would say, uh, is my husband faithful to me? And the husband would be like 10 feet away watching <laughs> me and possibly even hearing what, what the woman had just said. Usually they'd make it very confidential. And I learned right away, I am not going to say anything. I am not going to, I am not going to, give any information on this because I, I could get killed. <laughs> it's <just> not <laughs> funny. You know, you, you put yourself in that, paint yourself in that corner and people expect an answer. So what I learned to do is condition the sitter with my pendulum. Uh, and I would say, well, I can't really help you, but, and I would use the excuse. I would say, you already know the answer, right? You're just, you want me to validate that. So again, it's like getting this validation from somebody who outside yourself when you already already know the answer. So what I would do is I would take my pendulum and I'd say, have you ever used one of these? And they would say, no. And I'd say, this is a pendulum. This is what we use for, for answering questions that we deep down already have an answer for. So I would draw a circle much like this one. This is a kind of a Trump, oh, I shouldn't use that word, a faked circle. But you see it's a circle that is bisected by these lines. So it's really simple. I would just draw a circle and then I draw a plus symbol in, in the center. So, and I would tell the person, this can tell you the answer and it will be absolutely for sure because it's coming from your nervous system. Mm -hmm. And I would say, I love this line, I would say, you know, there's 27 miles of nervous system if we put it end to end. And we're going to add this piece of chain to that 27 miles. And this, this pendulum here will act as the resonator at the end of the at the end of the trail, whatever you want to call it. Then I would show them, I would say, hold it over the circle and usually for most people, if it's a Yes answer, it will move side to side like this or backwards and forwards. Very small movements, it doesn't take very much. If it's a no answer, it will go in a circle like this. And I tell them, you know, just think of the word no and the O in, in uh, no. So I'm conditioning them. I'm suggesting to them that this is how it's been for thousands of years. You're no different. See? So then I have them hold the pendulum over the circle. And I say, now you need to, to make sure this is correct. Because some people, it's the exact different. Uh, it's different. If it moves in a straight line, that's no. If it goes in a circle, it's yes. I don't know why. So let's test it. So they hold it over the circle. And I say, ask the pendulum a question that can only be answered by yes. So they would say something like, am I at Eddie Murphy's birthday party? And the pendulum would go back and forth. Sometimes it would take a while. But the thing about it is, I'm betting that sooner or later, it's going to move. There are stubborn people who where it just stays perfectly still. That's fine. I've got all the time in the world, right? <laughs> so I just sit there and I just wait. And, I, and they say, well, it isn't moving. I said, "That's I'm not controlling it. It's up to you. So sooner or later, they're going to they're gonna move it backwards and Their forward. Hands gonna that's, that's a, yeah, that's a yes answer. Or if there's other people around, the other people are like, come on, get on with it, you know? So it says yes, and they say, okay. 
And then I say, now ask a question that is, uh, can only be answered by a no. So they would say, do I have feathers growing out of the top of my head? And it would sooner or later go in a circle. So now we've established the condition response that they, they have to believe that now because it's in their hand. I mean, they don't have to, but usually they do. So now I say, okay, now you know how to operate this. And I take the drawing away and I say, ask the question in your mind, is my husband faithful to me or not? And guess what? <laughs> <laughs> they get the answer. No, <laughs> they get they get the answer that they already knew in their mind, but they couldn't face it. Mm -hmm. So then I say, there you go. You know, I'm. This is not an exact science. I am not making any accusations, but you have now you have now answered your own question. So mm -hmm. it may sound like this is a bunch of bullshit. This thing, okay, but it's therapeutic for some people. So. Did I help her? I don't know. Did I help her? I, I would say, yes, I did. But, you know, that's up to, that's up to the marriage counselor, not some guy sitting at a party with his tarot cards. <laughs> so that's, that's interesting to me because the conditioning that you talk about for facilitators is that you start with something like a fill in the blank or um, you show them a picture and ask what the picture is and and of course the facilitator is going to know what the answer is and and right um, and and you're assuming that the person you're working with also knows the answer but that's not what you're really thinking about you're thinking it's going to work if if the answer is if i fill in that blank then then it's gonna it, that means that it's worked you know that yeah. actually has worked and it's and it's not necessarily um, I don't know how conscious is it, it is at that level. It, it would be, it's really hard for me to put myself, it was 30 years ago. So to put myself back in that particular position, but the, the conditioning you're talking about is does the fill in the blank exercise yeah. work? Yeah. It's, it's a subtle way to say, Hey, I'm the expert here. <laughs> you don't know anything about it, but we know that this has been around for a thousand years. So and people who don't know anything about it, they walk away, you know, I'm gonna have to get one of those. You know? So it's, it's, it's a pitch, it's a, uh, it's a con, I think, you know, it, it's a con, but who am I to say whether, that, whether I saved the marriage or not, you know? Or other, you know, <clears throat> is my cancer gonna go away? I mean, I'm not going there. So, you know, and I don't really want to, I tell people I don't really take medical or legal questions, but here, if you want to in private after I show you how it works, and this, this pendulum is really great because it opens up, right? And you can put, I don't think there's anything in here right now. You can put something inside of it, you see? So you can put oil inside there and it will find oil. You can put water inside there or find water. You can put a diamond in there and it will help you find diamonds. I mean, you can go all the way around the world with this thing. And, you know, I never say it's 100% accurate because that would be wrong. But I, I suggest that it might lead you in the right direction. So, so that is what isn't, wouldn't you say facilitated communication is like, 90% suggestion on the part of the facilitator? I would think so. And yeah, I mean, it's, I, the question that I had was, will it help you find a letter on a keyboard? You know, if, you, if you're considering that your hand and the other person's hand is a, is a pendulum, yeah. then will, if it's up in the air and you're, you're hovering over a letter that you think you're going to select, will it help you stop on that letter? Well, but that's predicated by the fact that you are assuming that the sitter, the person holding the pendulum, understands how a pendulum is supposed to work. And that's a pretty big leap. Or a keyboard. Yeah, or a keyboard. So Yeah, maybe maybe it's more idiomotor effect that, that affects the keyboard selection. I'm just yeah, you know, I'm yeah. maybe I'm, I maybe know a little bit more than then our conversation, you know, like a little advanced for our conversation, maybe. Well, yeah, I wonder about you how, mean, 
This <laughs> keyboard. Yeah, we're going to be What's talking all keyboard? about the Ouija board. This is going to be great. I've been wanting to talk to Mark about the Ouija board for a long time. What I want to know is, um, as Mark is, is, is talking about this, this effect, this idea that something on a chain or a string that's heavy at the bottom, whatever it is, has any, you know, I mean, it's just silly. I mean, look at the angle your arm is at. It's very tiring to do for a long period of time. And longer chain is better. What's the, for the I mean, it just is kind of silly that, well, I'm, okay, I'm sorry that I'm saying this, but it is silly. This is going to be able to predict anything. Yeah, but you're a skeptic. I know. You know how many you thousands, know, hundreds girl. of thousands of pendulums get sold every day? And by the way, the longer the chain is, see, because it, what it does is the idiomotor response are tiny, if you believe in what the scientists say, and not in the supernatural, they're, they're little tiny muscle movements that you cannot control. You cannot hold your hand perfectly still. And if no. you set, set in motion this, this belief or this protocol, then sooner or later, it's going to move. And that's all it is. So yeah, like you say, your arm is tired. Well, Janice was, you know, here's the idea. You know, one of the really important reasons why we needed to talk to Mark was, is that facilitators, in my opinion, probably starting out, really don't think they're moving the person's hand. They, they're saying to themselves, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Or they'll say, I didn't move it. I didn't move it. But you know, look, you can't be perfectly still. Uh -oh. You just can't. Well, Did I just time myself out? Mm -mm, you're her. I what see you. What the hell? <laughs> I see you. You do? Yeah. Yeah, I can you see change. you too. What'd you touch? Hold on a sec. You look a little brighter. Okay. Oh, okay. That was it. <laughs> Don't touch anything. <laughs> So we're talking about, I was saying, how can you possibly hold perfectly still? You are going you to make some kind of movement. And Just like when you go to a psychic, try going to a psychic and sitting, sitting two or three feet away from somebody, which is not a good idea right now. But <laughs> Don't do it if now. you're trying to hold perfectly still and not give any signals from the muscles in your face or saying yes or no, if you try and sit perfectly still, it's almost impossible to do that. And the, the reading will be over because the psychic is reading those things. So. Just like I'm doing right now, nodding my head and smiling. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you cannot help it. Your eyes move, your mouth twitches, you make a yes look like, or you make a no look like. I mean, you understand that and their game is up. So it's unconscious movements almost i mean i'm not sure i believe that because your subconscious and your unconscious who knows but your body won't lie that's basically the premise of the and this is how the amazing kreskin formed his whole act he would ha have somebody hide his check in the audience oh yeah tell us say, about that that's an interesting yeah that he would say Set it up, i i have no idea where my paycheck is and if i cannot find it in the next five minutes, then I will go home without my paycheck. So what he'd do is he'd take a handkerchief and he would fold it in half, like, like a triangle shape, and would have somebody who knows where the check is hidden, hold one end of the handkerchief, and he would hold the other end. This is in the audience of a large... Yeah, say two or three hundred people in an audience. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, He'd find his check. So the person, so he would leave the room. He would give a check to somebody in the audience and say, hide right. this. Yes. And then, then he'd come back out on stage and he would yeah. say, now we need to find my paycheck so I can get paid. And he'd yeah. have him hold at the end of the um, a handkerchief. So that is that the contact. That is like the keyboard or that is like the uh, pendulum. In other words, it's, it's called thought, thought reading. Technically, it's he is it it looks like he is leading the way, but in fact, the person who knows where the check is 
leading the way because they know the responsibility is he has to find that otherwise the show is over so he's making it look like he's leading but he's not he's following it's really amazing to see because he had to stop doing that because he kind of lost the ability you have to train yourself very carefully to feel for those tiny little muscle things. And after a while he got older, he, he couldn't do it. And he would, he would lose his check and he would get very angry at the person. Like, you're not concentrating. You know, what's wrong with you? And the poor little old lady would be like, I, I just know where it is. I don't, I don't know how to lead you there. So he doesn't do that anymore. So we got we kind of, kind of off track here, but again, it's, if you can sensitize yourself to those, and which is what they're saying in facilitated communication, is that this facilitator is, I mean, why does a person have to have a hold of the person? Right, that's a big question, right. Yeah, they're, right. they're filling in the blanks, you know? And it's just, to me, it seems so obvious when you see these things, and it makes me really sad to see these poor children, you know, because yeah. they probably have no idea what's going on. I think wow. I think there might be a difference between non-conscious and unconscious. I think I think as a facilitator, you're doing 75 different other things. You know, you're asking and answering the questions. You're holding a lot of times. You're holding the keyboard. You're mm -hmm. taking notes. You know, you're trying to supposedly you're coaching the person you're working with to look at the keyboard. So if you've got all those other things going on, then, then the fact that, yeah, that, that the distractions, then you're not really going to notice whether you're moving the person's hand or not. There's just too many other things going on. So I'm, I'm wondering if it's more non-conscious than unconscious. Cause I, I also think facilitator, I certainly did. And I'm, I don't think that I'm unique in this way. Sometimes thought I was moving the person's hand and sometimes I thought I wasn't. Um, of course, yeah, if, you talk to, if you talk to um, proponents, they'll say it's always somebody else. You know, it's not them moving the person's hand. It's some some you. other bad facilitator like me. But I got to the point where I'm saying, no, I think everybody has those. You can read it in the FC literature. Yeah. So, but they explain it. They rationalize it away or explain it away so that yeah. it's, they push it on to somebody else. If somebody else. So other facilitator, but not me. I would never move the person's hand. It's just like a Ouija board. In other words, did anyone ever put a blindfold on the facilitator? They they have um, blind. I don't I don't know if they've done exactly blindfolds, but they have blinded the facilitators to the information that's being passed. Yeah, um, and you can guess what the answer is, you know, like every yeah. single time. When if, the, if, when the the facilitator facilitator can't, if the facilitator can't see, then... Or doesn't know the answer. Yeah. It's yeah. obvious to us. That is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it is wrong. I mean, that's why we're having these talks, because yeah, exactly. I'm still, Susan and I are still meeting people who either thought it was debunked in the mid 1990s or haven't ever heard of it before. And there are, there's a whole new crop of people that are being um, duped by, by the people at Syracuse University and, and Virg University of Virginia and yeah. other people that are promoting facilitated communication. So that's exactly why we're having these talks. Yeah, and I mean, to, to, the, to the parents or the parent of that child, it's giving them false hope. But again, I, you know, it, it comes down to that moral dilemma where you say, is it helping anything or not? Yeah, that's the other thing. Is you know, you say, same thing about the psychic. There's people no say, harm in this. Oh, it's harmless. You, those people are going away with hope. You should just leave them alone. Yeah, we but, get that all the time too. So we have a question. Okay. Well, we've had Klaus um, Larson. Oh boy. Uh, many comments about um, that Mark's turning into a hippie. <laughs> That's right, dude. <laughs> we are not leaving the house. Sorry. And I am not going to cut his hair. And I think it Why don't you fine. come over and give me a haircut, Klaus? <laughs> <laughs> but one of the questions he says, 
Susan, you're absolutely right. I don't think many people start out wanting to deceive people, but as you get into it, you slowly move from foolishness to fraud because at some point you will come across a skeptic and you will learn that what you do is fake. Then you have a choice, give it up or continue only now to knowingly swindle people. Right. So Janice, has anyone ever, maybe yourself, ever written a book about how it is to swindle or is there- Oh yeah, there's, there's, lots, there's lots of literature on it. And there's, there's literature on FC and the Ouija board and, and FC on Clever Hans and FC on the idiom motor response. There's mm -hmm. been, there's, been uh, there's a research study, Howard Shane from Boston Children's Hospital is, is a communication director there at the, in the autism, um, it's not an institute, but whatever they call it, the, that department. And uh, they set up a, um, they wanted to look at the idiomotor response and they, they had um, a group of college students and a confederate that pretend that looked disabled and pretended that he wasn't able to, I think it was a he, but um, wasn't, wasn't able to communicate. So they were gonna try facilitated communication with them. And they primed him ahead of time um, and taught him what to do and stuff, showed him um, videos and things. And 80% of the students came out thinking that they had facilitated correctly with the person with disabilities. And they, the Confederate, they didn't, they didn't actually tell them um, what story went along with him. Yeah. So they, they, you know, so that was completely blinded both the Confederate and the people with, with. So they've tested, they've tested all this, and it, it all, in my mind, it aligns really, really well with Ouija board, automatic writing, idiomotor response, yeah. all that. It's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. Only you're the, the it, it's taken a step further, and you're working with the person, and not a not a pendulum or a weed right. set or whatever, which is much more dangerous, I think, than. Um. Well, automatic writing is a whole different kettle of fish, you know? It's like, you, you can go, there's a whole spectrum which direction you wanna go with automatic writing. You can, you can have a believer and go along with it and, and see what happens and have an open mind. Or you can be taken in by a charlatan who basically retrofits the information that you're auto supposedly automatically writing to go in a certain direction. Like if, if I did a hot read, I hope everybody know what, knows what that means. Hot it's read better. is I, I get, if I was unscrupulous, uh, I would get a little bit of information about uh, the person who's coming to the session. Uh, a word like uh, I will use Abigail. That's a whole other story I, I could tell you about. Uh, and then uh, I sit down and I just, I go into my automatic writing trance, I tear off a sheet and I, you know, you can do this for hours. Tell, but, tell me what it is. But tell soon, me what automatic writing is. And well, how automatic that. writing is supposedly uh, getting in contact with the spirit world by using a random process of just letting the spirit take a hold of the pencil or pen and coming through you and draw it could be a drawing it could be a word it could be a number anything that you feel is is coming through now a lot of people believe it go ahead do it because you can do a whole bunch of scribbles and see things in that because nobody says you can't you know look there's a little house there there's something about a new home for you. I mean, yeah. most of the time it's just a huge pile of scribbles. But within that pile of scribbles, if I throw in the name Abigail, and that means something to one of the people who are watching, and then I just keep going and keep going and keep going, and then, oh, I'm exhausted. I must stop. You know, it's like a card trick. It's like in the pile is now my force word. <laughs> okay. So then, I, then everybody has a glass of wine and we turn the lights up and we start going over each page. And then sooner or later, look, it says Abigail. 
everybody throws their hands up and says, we've made contact. So that's again, taking a, a psychic premise and fragilizing it by adding information that didn't come from anybody's subconscious or, or the spirit world. It was planted in there in order to get a hook in everybody. Mm-hmm. So I won't go into the actual story that I heard this from because it involves a dear friend of mine uh, who is a believer. So that's automatic writing and that's very powerful if you're a believer. If you're not a believer, it's just not going to work. Mm-hmm. So people want evidence, not anecdotes. So prove it. I think that goes along with um, some of the, especially early on when they were quote unquote proving that FC works. Um, it's, it's now with the advent of a lot of the communication devices, it's getting a little bit harder to, to mm-hmm. um, pick up the tricks unless you're looking at it. But there would be this string of, le- there was this thing called a Canon communicator. So it was kind of like a calculator with a tape that um, spun out and it, and it would, it would print out the letters one by one, mm-hmm. uh, kind of like a label maker. Yeah. And so there would be this, this group of letters, T L R H something or other, you know, and just gobbledygook really, but um, somewhere in there and you can, you can accidentally spell out part of a word right. and, the, and the facilitator would say, Oh, she meant cat instead of C L R T H, you know, somewhere in there, there was the word cat. <laughs> See, that that's, was- that's called retrofitting. Okay. That is, that is what that is. Uh, retrofitting means you're, you put a meaning onto it afterwards. Ah. And I mean, yeah, you see a little house, you see a wave, you think of the beach. I mean, it's all it's all based on the the how much of a believer is sitting there at the table. I really need to communicate with the spirit of Abigail or you know, you 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 choose your battles very carefully, but that thing with the tape coming out, that is that's called cherry picking, I think is the term <laughs> we're looking at. Yeah. 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 That, think, if you look at the um, proponent um, studies that prove FC works, they'll have lists at the end of what they deemed was correct and what was not correct. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, you can't, some of it you this can't is, even. This is spiritualism. That's yeah. all it is. It's a modern day version of spiritualism because it works through the emotions. It's such a strong emotion to want your child to communicate. So it's, that's, a, that's another connection that I see there is because it, there's so much emotion in a seance room. People really, really want to see something cross over. So here we have this modern clinical, so-called clinical technique, which it's totally charged by the emotion of the people involved, including yeah. the facilitator. So they well, can, be, it's they marketed can marketed be fooling themselves, good. right? Yeah. The facilitator. Oh, yeah. 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 So it's marketed as the technique of last resort. So a lot of these parents um, or even um, professionals that get into facilitated communication have tried the evidence-based methods, but they haven't, they haven't given them the answer that they've wanted. So there you they, go. Syracuse absolutely knows. I mean, that term came from the director of the, the facilitated communication institute at at which, which, which term? Which term? The the a technique of last resort. Oh, okay. So they absolutely know that they're drawing people in who are desperate to find an answer, and all of a sudden, they've got this this answer to the question that they've been asking all these years. And um, the the promoter of rapid prompting method is similar, and that's a that's just a a, ta- a spinoff of facilitated communication where the facilitator holds the board. Which mm-hmm. I think, if you're holding a board, that what you were talking about in terms of the pendulum, there's no way that you can keep that board still if you're holding it in the air, right? I mean, it's well, not only that, but you're there are probably people watching and they're anticipating that something's going to happen. You can't just hold the board perfectly still. You have, 
You have to put, put the child's finger and then move the board around. Well, they'll, they'll, they'll say, no, they'll say that the person with disabilities is, is um, pointing independently, which is technically true, but the yeah. facilitator is the one that has the board. So that's right. They're, they're, like they're, moving, moving, it, they're but, moving the target. It's like a right. moving target. Right. To where right. they went the finger. So, so Janice, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in, you know, you're talking about the Canon uh printer thing so somebody would type something and it, a little tape would come out with the letters on it yeah and then it would be for somebody later to look over the letters to see what it is that was read and then they they interpret it however they want i'm wondering if now with autocorrect that people are able to type much more cogent sentences because as a person is typing these programs are thinking for them they're they're spelling they're auto correcting the words as they're spelling them. They're uh, it's not like a typewriter. It's it's a computer they're using now. They're using iPads and and computers. So if somebody mm -hmm. starts typing the word uh, C, uh, like I don't know just any kind of adjective or anything that's longer than a couple couple letters, it auto corrects to it. So I would think that the communication coming out now is much more coherent. It's actual sentences or it's at least actual words because the computer's doing the thinking. Whereas before when it was the, like a typewriter or a Canon um, string of letters, you know, so how do they just, just a, if that's true, how does the, the community of facilitated communicators justify that now it's coming out where they're spelling much better words, you know, correctly. Whereas even, even with pronunciation, like with, with the apostrophes and stuff, yeah, I'm guessing um, the, the conditioning that Mark talked about earlier happens quicker because they believe that the words are coming out more accurately sooner. And they, there's also, they, they, they don't, <clears throat> proponents don't generally um, measure accurately the abilities of the people they're working with. So they, this unexpected or um, novel kind of language that comes out is part of the process that means that to them means it's working so and somebody so, else does the the does the, the decisions whether it's a word or not not the not the facilitator right right and yeah and they they think that that they're trying to define autism more as a locked in kind of situation where the person has abilities inside and all they need is a little emotional and physical support to get the those words to come out they don't they don't look at the person's actual spoken or written language abilities ahead of time they just introduce this this support and all of a sudden they're typing out full sentences so i i think i'm thinking that the conditioning happens quicker it's mm. um, you know like i think it just cuz you're cuz you're you're it's working sooner than if you were just yeah. sitting there waiting waiting for something to happen and all of a sudden you know bought that cannon it costs a thousand dollars it better work <laughs> that's well that's, that's the other thing yeah yeah that the time and the cost um for facilitated communication i'm sure that adds psychologically i've spent x amount on this canon communicator it's got to work damn it um, it's i'm gonna find a word if it takes <laughs> all day i mean that's just I'm yeah. wondering about like when you're in a school situation where you have limited time possibly and it's getting towards the end of the day or whatever reason that the facilitator doesn't use just like like Mark said with you've got a line of people at the party and they all want to you know hurry up it's my turn now I remember we used to do this when we'd play around with a Ouija board it'd be like nothing's happening and so people would be like well let's just make something happen really quick but if you're a facilitator and the class day is ending or it's taking excruciating amount of time to get the sentence out if this facilitator in their mind is going well let me just help this along a little bit because this is well, that's what they, yeah that's how the ouija board works i mean we're gonna run that video i guess eventually and you will see i mean these people are it was a television shoot they were you know anticipating something is going to happen and boy when you see that planchette move around that ouija board it's pretty, pretty darn amazing. And I mean, the, the, 
part, the video that's out that you can watch now doesn't show what happened at the very end. It, it gets to it, but it doesn't really show that in the end, more people believe than in the beginning, even though I explained and the scientist came in and explained as well what the idiomotor response is. Oh, I didn't touch it. I didn't touch that planchette. It moved by itself. Well, somebody out of the six people moved it, moved it and they yeah. just, they won't admit it, you know? So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing what happens with people and how they, yeah. they want it to be real. So. That's so, true. Should we talk about Clever Hans first before we go to Ouija board, or what do you guys want to do? Well, Clever Hans, I don't think really plays into this very much because that was a, a set of, um, well, I guess it could. I think it does. Go ahead, Janice, you start. I, I, think, I think that people kind of focus on the, um, the traditional FC form, which is, you know, hand on hand. Yeah, but there's there's um, different versions of FC now where it appears that the facilitator is not touching the person with disabilities, and and they're like, well, how can they possibly be cueing the person with disabilities? And I think that's where the the clever hands comes in because they're because of their body posture, they may move forward or backwards, or they may their they eyes may heads up or or you know whatever um, give visible cues that. Um, FC works after like several hours of working together. So you you start you start understanding the each other's rhythms and that, that's Body that's language. actually where I think Clever Hans comes in. Yeah. So should I explain? Yeah, yeah. go go ahead and explain. For people Clever who don't Hans. know about about Clever Hans. Very interesting. I'll put <laughs> up the something. link to it in the uh, in the feed. I'll well then I don't have to here. really no, say No, 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 go ahead. I'll put the article for people who want to know more details. Well, I, you know, I was an animal trainer and back back when I was first considering uh, as crazy as it may sound, uh, human animal telepathy, I was very interested in this. Again, I haven't always been a complete skeptic. I had these visions of how did that dog know how to that I was coming home uh, right then. And, you know, I, I really was intrigued by it. So Clever Hans was really what turned me around. Basically, here's this horse, here's this trainer. Uh, a, a crowd of people comes around and, and, and Clever Hans, uh, maybe there's a bunch of letters on a stand or he says, uh, Hans, what, how much is two and two? And the horse goes, Okay, four, uh, it gets more complicated, but that's the basic idea is the horse was able to add and subtract, okay? And it fooled people all over the world and, you know, uh, emperors of Prussia and everybody thought Hans was the answer to animal human communication. But I forget the name of the scientist, but uh, who was that? Stump or something. I'm sorry, Alan. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Oscar. What is it? P, his last name is P H. No, wait. P F U N G S T. Right. Oscar. Oh, Puff. He he was a uh, I believe he was a psychologist. Yeah. He started he started to notice that uh, the trainer was cueing the horse when when he would say, "Okay, Hans, what's two and two? He would look at the horse a certain way and the horse would as soon as he would get to four he would turn his head another way so the horse learned to just follow whatever the trainer was saying and then he'd get a carrot so <laughs> it was a little disappointing to find this out for a lot of people and other people said no that's not it and then they did all these tests where they figured you know we're get, we're going to have you in a suit of armor and see how well you do or whatever and it didn't work. So yeah, I mean, that's again, that's another another bridge to how psychics work is if you're trained to look for certain things uh, in a person's face, they will swear later that they didn't give you any any cue at all. But you cannot hide the muscles in your face. 
and a horse has an eyeball about that big, you know, so they know what to look for when they're, when they're going to get a reward. So it's a, it's, but now again, was, correct me if I'm wrong, Susan, the trainer who worked with Hans, he would, was he aware that he was cueing? I don't think he was. No, no. he, he was also not wore aware. a big hat, like a, a, a you a know, with a big grip. A yeah. And then whenever he, the horse was counting, so like the number, the target number was six. Yeah. So you could watch the, 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 the brim of the hat just fluctuate a little bit because the guy would be counting one, two, three, four, five, six, and stop. But you could yeah. see the movement in the hat just a little bit you know, the brim, because it was really flat. Right. And so the horse would watch that. And whenever the head stopped moving, then the horse yeah. would stop counting. Well, I think this is, again, another similarity to what people are falling for with FC. Uh, I mean, there's just so many, that's why I say it's kind of the modern spiritualism, uh, but there's nobody dead yet, you know, it's, it's just terrible. Well, I, I've heard it kind of um, described as a mourning culture, like like um, automatic writing and, the, and spiritualism and stuff. And I, I wonder if part of the, the bridge to FC with that is that people that fall for FC have a, I think, have a hard time accepting that their child isn't, isn't able to um, communicate in the way that they'd like to. And I think right. that there is a, there is a mourning you know, sorrow, grief that must happen. Absolutely. Um, that Absolutely. that plays into those emotions, and you're just trying to fill that. Yeah, that you know? hole. Yeah. I mean, my my son is autistic, and uh, when he was first diagnosed, I'll never forget that. I mean, the, the woman sat down and said, "You know, it's likely that your son will never speak again." And my ex-wife was just devastated by that. Just so she was like a bereaved uh, sitter that was willing to do anything to get him to speak again. So fortunately for us, we did a lot of intervention and a lot of, we did whatever we could. And now Miles is, people say he's totally normal. They can't, they can't see anything. You know, he started talking, now he's a filmmaker, you know. He wow. has a gift. And uh, so that gift has been, uh, uh, encouraged so we decided you know maybe he won't be able to tie his shoes right away but look at these drawings that he's making <laughs> so it was almost like a savant thing wow. and some things happened that were really amazing i mean i just so when people say uh does facilitated communication work i wish i had an answer i mean i don't think it's genuine but then again how are we going to have a definitive answer to that? Testing? Well, no, whether, whether I mean, again, is, if it's therapeutic, does it help the, does it help the parent? Does, does it help the child? Does it help anybody? No. Probably not, right? No. It takes away from the, the, the actual therapy they should be getting and the conditioning and the training and the help that they actually need because you've, you've bought into this miracle that doesn't work. And there are there are procedures, there are things that can be done. Well, why, why is it that they're getting away with this? <laughs> Janice? <laughs> it's the bereavement factor. Because universities are still supporting it. You There's know, and they, no. they, the argument is, is freedom of, of speech or whatever that they, they can, yeah, whatever. I, I don't understand it. If the, if the body of research and scientists are saying this is, this is, facilitator controlled and the technique that you're not that you're promoting has no they don't they don't actually test it they don't they they say fc works because people using fc say it works so that's the part where i don't i don't know how universities can still promote something that's so obviously glaringly errant in its in it you well, know they, they also promote uh therapeutic touch and uh, right. there's a list yeah right right I'm sorry I'm laughing it's just yeah so it's, it's, it's sad uh, it really is and you yeah. said it well like why is this still happening and it's like well you know Janice I did want to ask 
just like Mark was saying with Clever Hans, um, how we've seen over and over where somebody's holding a letter board and they seem to be uh, the person supposedly typing, you know, with their finger in the air. And then when they get to the end of the word, they remove the letter board, like, okay, we're done, or the end of the sentence. Or we've seen them where they take the letter board and they go like this, or they'll go like this, they have some movement, like, okay. And then when it's done, they're like, it's like they're the facilitator is the one who's deciding when we're starting, deciding when the letter or the word is sentence is over. And um, it's it's like a game, not a game, but it's like, like they've rehearsed it. They'll say, okay, here you go. And then they'll do it. They'll point to a couple things and then they'll move the hand away. And he said, he typed this. He typed he wants chocolate pudding for lunch. It's like, well, we didn't see that, you know, all we saw is him like waving his finger <laughs> on the board for a couple, mm -hmm. you know, for a couple words. Where do we get chocolate pudding from, you know? <laughs> How do you know he didn't say he had to go to the bathroom or, or he he's, wants a cat or, you know, I don't know. It's just like they're the one ending and beginning, just like with Mark said with the clout, with a, a clever Hans. Yeah. Well, there's also a video we've seen where the where the person with disabilities will interact with the keyboard by themselves and the facilitator actually takes the person's hand away. So they're training <laughs> yeah, they're them. Like, no, no, yeah. no, no, we're not doing that right now. We're yeah, they're training right them only to interact with the board when the facilitator has their hand. So there's a lot of... Yeah, if the board is in front of them and they know how to put the, isolate a finger and push a button, they should be able to type. Um, another question was raised and uh, Wendy had brought up another thing, uh, Sparky the Wonder Dog. And this was a- Sparky! Uh, Sparky, this is a, a IIG yeah. Jim Underdown had done. I guess there was a man whose dog supposedly, was like Clever Hans, was able to counter or something. I, I can't quite remember. But they went on to TV and Sparky and the owner were, the, and were there and they were answering questions all amazingly you know could count do multiplication or whatever it was but uh, jim's watching this from the from the sidelines and saying hmm this is interesting you know as long as the owner and the dog can see each other the dog is getting everything right so they took a break and i guess jim drug this really giant plant that was off to the side on the stage really big plant and drug it so that the dog couldn't see the owner so right. the owner was on the other side of the plant now and then they asked the dog a question and the dog would bark that's what he would do is whenever he was counting and so so now that they can't see each other the dog's like ruff, 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 you know going on and on and on I need to see that video. Remind me, I got to see that video. Sparky the Wonder Dog. But so as long as the dog could see the owner, he knew the answer. So however, whatever method they were, it was using, whether the owner knew it or not, which I have a feeling he didn't, because if he, if he knew that he was cueing the dog, he wouldn't have gotten behind that plant, you know? Right. It's just like everything went fine with the Ouija board until we put blindfolds on everybody. Then suddenly the spirits didn't know how to spell very well. It's so, kind of the same thing. So let's set this up. Um, Mark has been asked to do a show in New York for brain games on the Ouija board effect. And you fly to New York and they put you in a, can you describe the room of where they put you? Oh, it's just, it was a, a large studio space and it was uh a lot of rugs on the floor to give it that Eastern look. It also helped uh, dampen the sound down because we wanted to have to make sure there weren't any extraneous sounds coming in that could be construed as coming from the spirit world. So mm -hmm. it had to be very carefully uh, staged. And then they brought in, I believe it was six people. I think it's four. It was four? I, we'll see the video in a minute, but where did they find remember. these people? Do you remember? Oh, central casting. Who knows? I never ask because I don't really want to know. Because if, <laughs> if I find out that they're, you know, the producer's daughter or something, I have to be very careful about coming down to too beginning. hard on a, <laughs> that person. So, you, you know, I didn't, I don't really want, don't remember. I just know they were, they were uh, actors. So they pulled so, them in. 
we pulled them in and then we first interviewed them and we said to each one of them, do you believe in uh, Ouija boards? And I think most of them said, I'm not really convinced. The one guy said uh, no, uh, but most of them said, I haven't made up my mind. That's why I decided to do this. So we got all that on camera and then I sat down and you'll see what happened. And then after we watch it on the other side, as they say on, on the new show, I will explain the, uh, <laughs> the disappointment yeah, of, uh, of what we, we do hour, as, we have a three as minute, activists. Three minute, that. one second clip we're going to show you for the show called Brain Games. This yeah. aired in 2015, 16, I'm trying to remember. And uh, you can see the whole show if you were to, I think you probably have to buy it or get it on Prime or something. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think the whole show is, is online because this was just one segment. Yeah, so I think you have to And unfortunately, the thing. segment that we have doesn't show the scientists explaining idiomotor response, but I think everybody by now knows what that is. Okay, so we're gonna show this segment. Let me pull it up over here. As I said, it's three minutes, one second. And what you're going to see is Mark is sitting at a table. There's Yes, there's, go ahead and play And there's uh, carpets on the floor. And then there's people. Let me, oh, shoot, my, my crystal got in the way. And I. That'll happen. Uh, you know, Get that pendulum out. Your, th your thoughts are now trapped it's inside the walls. Of the <laughs> Here we go. Now, can you guys hear this? I can't hear anything. Susan? Susan? I can't hear anything. Top of the cord. I don't have sound either. Susan. There is no volume. Oh. oh. All right, you guys. I know. Hold on. Okay, so I see that it's not got a, a somebody, I was told that there's no sound. Is that right? Yeah, we didn't hear a sound. Well, what the heck? You can kind of tell what was happening, but. <sighs> Sorry, you guys. Wendy just texted me and Barry Carr just texted me. I'll, I'll... So let's see what happened. Pause the recording for probably being heard through my speakers, and that's what you guys would say. All right, you guys, hold on.
I hate technology. I love <laughs> technology because it is amazing. You can do this. You can hear that now. Paranormal. Start it over. Okay. It is. Is helping these volunteers use a Ouija board to reach out to the spirit world. That's Grandma, the beginning. Are you happy? And can we hear it now? I can hear it, but it's really low. Yeah, and also it's jerky. The movement is not smooth. It stopped. I stopped it right now. Let's see. Let's see if we can figure this out. Maybe we should just have a fail. We're trying again. No, go ahead. I had stopped the stop the video. You know, basically, once the uh, blindfolds were on, then the the spirits didn't know how to spell anything. Even though we showed that and we explained it at the end when we asked the the sitters, you know, now do you believe in the Ouija board? All of them said yes. <laughs> so oh. was, we have wasted all of our time. But this is this is what we're up against. I mean, even though the evidence clearly shows that you you're fooling yourself, didn't matter because these people they wanted to believe so much. So that's why a lot of the times when Susan and I go out and do these things, it seems to just make it worse. You know? No, that's not true. I don't. Well, that it it, it bothers me because I want to hear people say, "Wow, science is you know." All magic is science. All, you know, I am, I am converted. Where's the next skeptic conference, you know? <laughs> it doesn't happen. It's more like people saying, well, like the girl said, they didn't, they didn't really show this. Why don't we just move on, Susan? So I'm going to put the link in the, uh, the chat area so people can see it there. Yeah, Kenny Biddle just put it up right now. Thank you, Kenny. Anyway, at the end, they didn't show this, but... The one blonde girl who, uh, blonde who was sitting in the circle, she was like a believer from the beginning. And when I asked, I asked uh, the girl on the other side, I said, well, you know, she was, she was feeling that she got in touch with her grandfather. And totally, I mean, uh, right before the commercial break, she was just like, I can't believe it. You got T.O., Phantom of the Opera. I, he, that was his favorite piece of music. You know, they were dead set that it was real. And, did, show, uh, did the video get as far as showing the people with the blindfolds on? Yeah, but there was no sound, so it doesn't it's, matter. You did see it, though, right? I, I, we should just leave that behind. All right, you guys. I'm so sorry. That I, yeah, I just the way it goes. Technology. So what I was saying is, <laughs> so I said to her, you, you know what, your grandpa knows what year he died. And she says, yes. And I said, and, uh, and you know what year he died. So we put the blindfolds on and then I said, I'm gonna write down what, what you, where you stop on the Ouija board. And first they went to one blank part of the Ouija board, another blank, but no, and then, they, then they, they went to JK blank blank. So I said, now take your mask off. I said, this, this is not a date. This is just gobbledygook. So at the end, they didn't leave it in, but the one believer said, you just don't know what JK blank blank means yet. But you're going to find out, you know, I mean, right to the very end, somebody's like, come on now, you know, like some revelation is going to happen to me where JK, John Kennedy, blank blank. It's, wow, you it's just went to it to John Kennedy. Well, I just did. But yeah. my point is, she that's the kind of thinking that we're up against. So she we just John wanted Kennedy the date. That's all we wanted was the year. So that's, that's why a lot of times I get frustrated. Susan, Susan has a better attitude. Than I, but I get so frustrated. The way I look at it is, in that moment, when that woman and, her, and the other women were sitting there, and they were experiencing this idiomotor effect, they needed to save face and they needed to say uh oh i'm not an idiot there's no way i i of course it works and so at that moment it's confusing to them they're they're coming yeah. to grips with this idea that 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 they hadn't really thought about before and they're saving face yeah and i think that if we were able to have handled that show in a different way which you don't have time for because you're i had you know, nothing to do with it yeah, yeah. Well, if they were able to bring them along and let the person, and then maybe 
say to them, okay, so now we're going to take some time and think about why you got a different result with your blindfolds on than you did whenever you could clearly see. Yeah, but see, that wasn't what the show was about no, for 10 minutes. No, segment. but that's what I mean. The people are going to say, I didn't push it. No, there must be something to it. And then maybe they didn't like you very much. Maybe they were like, well, that guy is just a jerk. You know, he thinks he knows everything. So I'm going to tell him. But I think yeah. what happens is when the person leaves the building and they think about it, I think they have a different, if we were able to follow them along later, I think they would have a different attitude, especially when their, their show comes out on TV and all their friends and family are watching it going, Oh, come on, don't be an idiot. Of course, the yeah, but see that, that it. they didn't show that part of her saying, you just don't know what JK blank blank means yet. I and she was, in fact, the producer of the show had to step into the circle and say, okay, hot. look, what? <laughs> she was getting quite like, shirty. very, very angry about, about the whole thing. And the producer mm -hmm. said, you know, the cameras aren't rolling. We're done. Let's not even get into it. So. Mm -hmm. But, I bet but it's still like you later after work the that fact. hard. You want somebody to have the, in magic, we call it the aha moment. That's where somebody is totally stunned by something that they see in magic. And then you show how easy it is and they say, aha. But that's what I mean with the show. They didn't quite allow the time for those people to have an aha moment. If they could have pulled them off to the side, let them talk about it and think about it and then come back and then right. film them, they, no. I think it would have had a different effect. It wouldn't have I been think we just have to. We just have to assume that most of the television audience is with us on this. I think they all got it. And if you look at the comments in these videos, uh, when you look at the comments in the feed, I think they're all gonna be, and I haven't looked, so I'm not really sure. But yeah. <laughs> I'll leave that to you guys watching this live. They'll go back and they'll say, um, you know, the comments are probably like, well, of course, yeah, if you can you find the whole the show, it's, guys it's blinded. Much better. Well, the links inside the um, is it here inside the uh, Facebook page um, thread. Move on or whatever. On YouTube, are looking at are interested in finding. It's called "Do You Believe?" If you type in "Do You Believe Brain Games," um, and if you type in, I guess Ouija board or something like that, it'll help you find this video. Even you know, it's three minutes one second and. Um, I think it's fascinating. I know that Penn and Teller did one also where they did something of the sort and then they put the blindfolds on the people and then they turned the Ouija board upside down and put the planchette on it. So not only could they not get a letter, they were up, it was upside down and nobody knew it. They did that with a, in, I think it was in Finland with a double blind test. The last double blind test for FC was done in 2014. And they 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 blinded the facilitators so they couldn't tell what was going on. But they turned the keyboard, the letter board, upside down, and the the um, people still facilitated in the same as if they were, the letters were facing up. So it was the same exact. That's just yeah. We got a comment, I, Kitty. Fortunately, that group they banned FC. Um, in their school system, so that was good. But you I know, think that would pretty much do it. Yeah, yeah, but no. the facilitators, no. the proponents, read the same. The same research studies are available, and they still find a way to discount it. So, um, I I tend to think that. I mean, I agree that the media is a can be a problem at times in getting the whole story out, and mm. and I think that that the the there probably are more people who don't believe in FC or psychics that, that do than people who do. Yeah. But it's those stories, the miracle stories are what sells and those get more airtime. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, it's, it's, uh, we tend, the work that we do, we tend to focus on uh, how bad something is. And every once in a while we find out that 80% of the people out there have a brain. <laughs> You know, it's like, well, oh, thought about it. Well, that makes me feel better. I wonder if I had anything to do with that. Well, well, whatever, you know, but it's yeah. still frustrating because it's just, you know, science is so, so much better than magic. You know, I mean, all magic is science, but not all uh, science is magic. And 
that's it's that simple you know yeah. there were two facilitators in my situation i think there were probably a couple more but two main ones me and another person and after i went through the testing and the test results were made public the person came up to me and said if i had been in that testing situation it would the results would have been totally different she was convinced yeah. that that it would have worked for her when it didn't for me and, well, and people, that's, were, that's, con people yeah. were convinced that the moon landing didn't happen <laughs> it's right. like, you right. just can't because you as soon as you challenge them there then you're the enemy and it's I, I don't know i guess we just have to do the best we can kenny biddle has uh given us a comment about okay. kenny by the way he said in my own experiments with several participants we found that fatigue sets in the arms since you're holding your arms up to keep your fingers lightly on the planchette the first person that got tired and dropped their arms slightly would nudge the planchette and the other participants would just go along with the movement ah, yeah. interesting. that makes sense that does make and sense. once the once the movement starts there also have been studies with fc where they've they've put like a, a rod or a string or whatever between the two the facilitator and the person with disabilities and once that movement starts it's harder to tell who's actually controlling it it's much easier to actually move the planchette around or the whatever yeah, it is, the, yeah. well once 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 the movement has started then yeah it's much much easier for everyone else to join in you know because they don't want to feel like they're blocking the spirit world or anything and I, <laughs> I put my fingers on it i just would hold my hand down so mark on the video um i don't know i can't remember what the question was that was asked that the answer was phantom of the opera but i yeah. know that the the only letters i think that came out were uh, p, p and o, o. and yeah. from p and o she got phantom of the opera right and remember what the question was how you mm -hmm. worded it that that was it like what's your grandfather's favorite opera i mean that couldn't have been the question was it no there was no question at all she just uh I, we said let's see what else we can get but it was about her grandfather yeah once she once she broke through to grandpa she her emotions started to flood her thinking so she was making connections uh, i don't remember all of them uh but you know each time she she got something she would make a stronger connection and you could see that she was brightening like wow i'm really i'm really reaching grandpa you know and then i said well what about the date he died sorry nothing you know and she you can see in the video she looks very crestfallen which i hate to do to people but you know what someone's got to shake things up someone's got to at least give them a choice you know so this nobody has been about how you know nobody wants to admit that they were they were that they were wrong stupid, yeah and that they fell for it and especially on camera nobody wants to admit that they had a part in moving that planchette around and when you see it it's like a little miniature race car track there's one <laughs> all over the place it's like whoa I really didn't expect that. I I expected the planchette to move tentatively, you know, at first and maybe go to yes or no. But they were just like, whoa, the whole, you know, the whole thing was gyrating around. It was unbelievable. I remember we had uh, when my kids were teenagers, we had the neighbors over and we pulled out a Ouija board. And Not anymore. <laughs> No, 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 too close together. But what happened is, um, I can't remember if it was Sterling or Caspian was was leading it, and they were pushing the board around. Probably was Sterling, and he and and the neighbor kids were going, "Oh wow, there really is a spirit here!" And and I guess Cat, Sterling was just having a blast with it. And and I think I said, "Well, this house has been owned by one other person before. His name is Leo, and he's the guy who built the house." And they're like. So I think Leo came through, this spelled out the L-E-O, and, and, you know, and the kids were like, oh, this is great. This is great. And then I, <laughs> my kids were just messing with them and just, you know, pushing them around. Uh, he, Sterling, I think it was Sterling, he confessed it later. He said that, you know, I was just pushing around. I'm really surprised that, that the neighbors were, were so into it and, and just took it uncritically. Like, well, of course there's a dead spirit here. And of course we, you know, he's contacting us. And of course, 
Uh, Paula? I'm, I'm constantly amazed how some people are totally terrified of Ouija boards. Oh, I was. I, I yeah, was told if they see one, they will just be like, you're evil. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. We weren't allowed to play with them. Um, I you get to that point with facil facilitated communication, you know, so that people go, oh, no, that is evil. Paula, Paula, uh, Paulinda has just said that the planchette always spells rude words when she uses it for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Why? But <laughs> that's just her. Why? Yeah. You know, when we were growing up, my neighbor had a, a Ouija board, and I, I was freaked out. You know, I was like, we, I went over to her house, and she had it, and she was, she was a Native American, so they didn't have. She wasn't a Christian, you know, like how I was raised. So she had, she didn't see it that way, or her parents didn't. See you used it a way. wine glass, right? No, we had an actual board, just like you went down oh, and bought okay. it at the grocery store or bought it at the toy store, however you buy it. And uh, <laughs> at one point in history, the Ouija board was the best selling uh, Milton Bradley toy. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, Kenny says that his planchette always points him towards the rum. <laughs> See, now we're laughing. We're having fun at this. And there's a lot of people who think that um, this is a horrible thing. I remember. It's burning that, hell magic. Yeah, that if you use the planchette, if you use the Ouija board, mm -hmm. then it's opening yourself up to having demons come and live and, you know, come and get into you. It's a portal that's being opened up whenever you use it. That's what I was told. And that a demon, well, that would well, You're be weird. <laughs> I'm talking about that's what my parents, well, my mom, I think, or I picked it up from church somewhere, because I don't know if I'd even mentioned that the neighbor had a, a, a Ouija board, because... I might not have been able to go play with that my friend anymore if if she had known there's a Ouija board in the house. Interesting. I you didn't have that, Janice. No problem with that. No, we we played with the Ouija board some, but I I don't know. I don't really remember having much. Oh, it was like, one way or the other. No way. And I, I have a Ouija board that I've burned into three pieces. And, uh, sometimes I'll have that appear on the seance table you know what the hell is this it's all charred nice <laughs> well you got to be dramatic <laughs> we had a even as an adult when my kids were teens I, that's when i got the ouija board i went down and bought one myself and i said i'm going to i want my kids to see it know what it is and not be afraid of it and i remember leaving it around the house whenever you know different people would come over for different reasons and um I believe that one of my Christian friends was just like, oh, that has to leave the room now. And I was like, it's just a game. It's a piece of paper. Oh, no, we can't have that in the room. Well, I've seen that happen with a, a pendulum, too. I had a party and Robin DeWitt, who I mentioned before, Cardor, he was in his full shadow costume, a big old brim hat and black coat and he did some very simple tests with a pendulum and uh, the a woman got up and said, I can't be in this room anymore. I feel the evil. And of course he played that up, you know, evil, what evil, where, where is that? She ran out of the house and we never heard from that person again. I read a, I read a book called the, uh, something, I think the title is, um, the Planchette or the Despair of Science. And it was written in the late 1800s, I think. Yeah. And I think the, the guidelines in that for using the planchette are the guidelines for facilitated communication. You can almost, <laughs> how, like how you do don't that? test, you, you have an open mind. If you're skeptical, it doesn't work. And mm -hmm. you know, all those kinds of things um, are very, very similar. You know, I may be reading, taking a little bit of a leap, but they're very, very close. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that a lot of the principles are based on uh, Ouija boards and, uh, and other uh, techniques that were used by uh, mediums and uh, people who, it was a party game. So, you know, it's, there's all sorts of nuances and subtleties that, yeah, I'm sure they are written into the, you know, the dogma of facilitated communication. So we have, a, we have a statement, Kenny says that he has, he calls them talking boards. 
Yeah. Yep. He says, I have about 14 of them. He actually, one time he spread them out in his living room overnight. And then when he got up in the morning, there was no, no messages or anything for him. And oh, then darn. Carmen, Carmen, came, Carmen came in and she says, well, the problem was that they were in the living room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Yeah, Kenny sent him, put him out on the floor of the dead room, <laughs> the spirit room or something, and that wouldn't be the problem. But they have a, but you know, I don't remember, or I don't even know if I know, where did the problem come from this board game, you know, mid, like, you know, Monopoly or something, going over to, you know, this feared thing from Christianity. I wonder if it's something because that. because people have bad things happen to them, which happens normally in life. And they were like, you were playing with that Ouija board the other night, weren't you? Look, you see. So it's like a cognitive dissonance. You know, blame it, blame it on something. You got to have something to blame their, your troubles on just like this. This psychic and this thing we're investigating for ABC. I mean, she just was a complete train wreck. And she blamed a lot of the things that were happening with her uh, on so bad one. luck or a curse. Set that up. You've already mentioned it. So give us like a give us a minute on what you're talking about so people will know what you're talking about. Well, we just did a, a, a TV shoot yesterday <clears throat> for uh, it's called the con. And it is about people who are conned out of their life savings and, uh, you know, all with this uh, Romany, uh, you know, this black curse that's on you and I will take it away. And the person Bob, who- Bob um, Nygaard is gonna be there. Yeah, Bob Nygaard is involved in it. And uh, the, the uh, person who were, we were talking about yesterday lost $780,000. <laughs> I know. And all it was was conditioning over a long, long period of time, and basically the psychic sticking to her story and not backing down and not taking the hook out of this person. But you know, uh, she had she had a lot of problems, and uh, it only took somebody to suggest to her that, oh, it's this this black black curse over you, and I can get rid of it, to convince her that she needed to. Uh, it's a long story. You'll see it. It'll be running uh, hopefully in the fall. Uh, <coughs> unbelievable, unbelievable story. Really sad. But I won't. I won't go into it because you get to watch it live. <laughs> well, well, not live. So um, I also thought I wanted to let's do let's do the automated writing. Uh, story. We already did it. No, you didn't talk about what happened i or do you want me to tell it i don't think we should go there that's kind of a personal story and the person who was involved with it is a dear friend and i don't even if well, i didn't everybody's mention going, it, what what i could do it without mentioning names yeah but you might get the story wrong no no i i know the story you tell the story then that way i can the heat is off me so Mark's got some good friends that lived in LA and they lived, let's say nearby the Charles Manson um, murder scene, the Sharon Tate house. Okay. So this might be interesting to see how you, how you phrase all this. So the story is that when I met Mark years ago, he told me this story that he had been told. So it's told to a friend of a friend and, uh, <laughs> What happened was Mark was told is that after the murders, they had had a, or no, it was before the murder. Uh, before the murders, they had had a, a automatic writing session. The, the people had come over to the, his friend's house, and there was an automatic writing session. And afterwards, they revealed that the, one of the names was Abigail. And Abigail was one of the people who eventually would be murdered in the Sharon Tate house, Abigail Folgers. So Mark told me this story and I was like, what? That's crazy, you know, that, that's, that's a pretty interesting story. So fast forward a few years and I meet Mark's friend and we're at her house. And I said, tell me this story about Abigail and the automatic writing. 
And what happens is, is the story as she tells it is different. And what she, she, she still has all of the automatic writing. But, but what she, the story she tells me years after you told it to me is that the, that they were having an automatic writing session after the murders, after they still knew. Still not clear on that. I'm thing. sorry. As I want to believe. <laughs> but yeah, if you know that there has been a horrible murder in a house very near you, like almost next door, and one of the murder victims is somebody named Abigail, and you're doing an automatic writing session, and the name comes out either clearly Abigail or it's interpreted to be Abigail looking at it later in the pareidolia, then yeah, but it, see how the story changes. You know, we weren't there that day. Maybe and, I misremembered it. And Mark hears it. the story from them, and it's one way, and he tells it to me, and it's told a different way. And then when I sit down with the people and I say, tell me the story 30, 40, 50 years ago that happened, I'm hearing a different story. And that's how these kind of things are, are continued, you know, because you don't want to make anybody into a liar or anything, but our memories don't work right. And I think it was probably very likely it was after the story because, you know, it, it what is more likely, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. A friend of a friend is what um, Kenny Bill saying. Yeah, it was Abigail Folder, Folgers, Folger. I still, I still believe the first story, <laughs> even though <laughs> well, I know better. It just makes a better stories. story, you know. <laughs> it is a much better story, but the truth is, I think that it. I mean, why would you have an automatic writing session a couple days or, or a few days or whatever weeks or whatever after a, this horrible murder had happened in a house almost nearby? That just seems almost macabre you know well it wasn't it was one of many they used to have what what were used to be called salons at their house where people would get together and do these sorts of things yeah that was quite common with artists and writers and stuff to use automatic writing it's pretty common practice yeah the surrealists that was one of their favorite favorite things to do when they you know just for hanging around they would mm -hmm. They would do that. They would also do what was it called? The uh, the perfect corpse? No, I can't remember. Where they fold a sheet of paper in three, and one artist would do one part, and one artist would do the middle part, and one would do the bottom part. Really incredible stuff. But they thought that they were in touch with spirits too. So. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought that was just a yeah. party game. Yeah. Well, Magus and Ernst and. They were very interested in the unconscious mind. So yeah, you're right. Artists are known for these fanciful experiments. Other people are just drinking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna get close to ending this. So if there's anybody who had a last question for Mark or Janice or I, get it into the comments. Or section. comment. <clears throat> So that we can answer that quickly before we leave today. Um, while while we have this brief moment here, I'm going to do a shout out again. That uh, please, uh, this is a part of a series that Janice and I have been doing. I think we're on video eight. So like yeah, that. Mm -hmm. and you can go to the About Time Presents no About Time Project on YouTube, and we'll put a link up here for it in our you know in the link area where the comments are. And you can please like us, like the show, like the talks. And um, please, um, you can check out the whole series that Janice and I have been doing on facilitated communication. As far as I know, this is the first deep dive anybody has ever really done in, in a lasting matter of talking to experts and people who know what's going on behind the scenes. Besides Janice, who's obviously an expert on it, um, facilitating uh, rapid prompting method. Uh, maybe college classes all over will be looking at these videos. Hi, future people watching our videos. <laughs> I hope so. It's Don't. all a trick. <laughs> and, um, Don't fool yourself. So please subscribe. That's the I worst think. person to fool is yourself. There you go. I think I've done 26 or 27 already talks with different people in the community. These are people I, most of them I know and uh, have interesting stories to tell. And I will be continue to do those. If you'd like to be um, watch them on YouTube, they're there, and we'll put them up with a, within about a day of them leaving Facebook. 
But if you want to be notified when we're going to be doing another talk, please go to About Time Project on Facebook and like it. Um, you can also set your notifications for when Susan Gerbeck or About Time is live. You can set those, those parameters so that you'll get a notification. Of course, it's not going to give you a lot of notice, but we always make an event page. And so you can go and uh, like it and it'll give you a reminder that it's coming up. Um, sorry, I don't have a lot of sophisticated ways of doing this. We have, like Paula has been helping us a lot in getting the word out and getting the events set up and getting them out. But, you know, this isn't, uh, this isn't a business or anything. I'm, this is not a professional thing. Not yet. Uh, so uh, Wendy says that this was ultra interesting and she says, thank you very much. And she gives us a couple hand emojis. I'm not sure which one. Of my God, I've are. lost my pendulum. You didn't. <laughs> and Leonard said the easiest person to fool is yourself. Who said that? Leonard. Yeah. Leonard Tremell. Janice, Definitely. any final thoughts from you? Me? Janice. Uh, no, I, I just think this is so fascinating to me because I, when, when all this was happening to me, of course, I felt like, oh, this is the only person that, you know, I was the only person that this was happening to and blah, blah, blah. And, and it's not true. There's this, this whole world that I never really even knew about um, with um, psychics and idiomotor effect and psychology and all that stuff that it's just mm -hmm. amazing to me that, that all this world exists and it's part of the human condition but sometimes it can kind of go wrong even if you don't want it to yes so i think educating people and talking about it is really helpful and i i just loved hearing hearing your perspective mark that's really cool thank you we had um Janice, well i have been doing can I do my closing comment okay hold on let me let me say mine and then and then i'll let you go to yours um janice and i have been doing this for a long time and as janice was as I was learning about more about facilitated communication, I was continually linking it to the world of the psychic because um, the feeling that a parent needs to get in touch with their child, whether the child is sitting right there next to them alive or it has died and now they wanna get in contact with them in the other world, it was the same. They were making the same, same leaps of judgment. They were making the same, um, excuses for for why the child was giving them such vague things you know it, it, the desire to want to believe it, it it to me it's it is severely linked to the um to the world of the psychics and and uh, i i couldn't help but see over and over the the, the commonalities okay mark uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really, like I said, it's like the new spiritualism and uh, something else crops up every other day these days uh, that is a, a, a mode of uh, this magical thinking, uh, which I love. I have no problem with it in the proper setting. It's just where people's lives get involved, that's where I get concern uh, that people are going to get hurt. And unfortunately, we find uh, the three of us and many others find ourselves in the in the uh, in the category of people who can hurt other people. You know, it's like most people won't go to the way of thinking that we go to because they don't want to. They don't want to hurt other people or tell them no, this doesn't work. Uh, your child will never communicate. It's just. It is taking advantage of people who are emotionally uh, tied into something that we don't really understand. Maybe one, well, one day there will be a breakthrough and this will be different. But right now, people really need to beware because we are in a world where uh, lying is an accepted business practice, let's face it. And I don't know how, whether it's gonna change, or not, but you start with you start with people's emotions and how how damaged they can get by believing in something, whether it's a pendulum or a Ouija board or a cannon. Uh, you know these things. You just have to say, Susan and I say it all the time. What is more likely that that this technique works or it's just a manipulation? 
and and I, I'm I'm on the side that says it's a manipulation until something comes through that's proven. Uh, then I'll be happy to change my mind. You know, just show me. You know, evidence. Anecdotes are not evidence. Thank you for paying attention, those of you who called in. It's been fun, and uh, I don't know how we get fun out of this, but it's I have to use humor, otherwise I'll I'll just go off the deep end. So thanks for being there. Yeah, Kimmy said uh, thank you for the show. He misses us, and Leonard Chamel said thank you so much, Mark. That was right on. Well said, Mark. Thanks, Leonard. Um, and I want to thank uh, um, Mark for being with us. Yes, Mark and I are in separate rooms. We're we're here together. <laughs> Imagine our conversations, our life. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. I really She's in the light. I'm in the dark. Yeah, yeah. Did you notice that? Um, I'm surprised we haven't been bothered by the cats. But <laughs> but I really appreciate you doing this. This is something I wanted to do for a very long time. I kind of wanted to get to a point where we were at where we could talk about avian motor effect. We'd already had a big basis of discussing facilitated communication. Um, we do have another talk. Oh, so let me just give you a, anybody Thanks, else. Thanks, Janice. It was fun Janice talking to you. Janice is amazing, of course. Yeah. Um, in an hour and a half, um, we're going to be, or an hour and 10 minutes, we're going to be meeting on Facebook. Uh, no, we're going to be doing another Zoom call if anybody else is interested in joining in. It's the Australian. We are. Project. Am I doing it too? Well, you can. It's the Australian <laughs> Prediction Project. Um, we're going to be oh, working with uh, Rich, Richard Saunders from the Australian Skeptics, who has a database of over 2,000 Australian predictions made from 2000 to 2020. And we meet together and we analyze all the predictions to try to decide if they're real. I mean, did Nicole Kidman really have a baby in 2014? Did a tornado really hit um, the Isle of uh, Man in 2010? So we can base the predictions and see if they're real or not. And if you'd like to be interested and involved in that, the I'll have a link to that. Uh, it's on my Facebook feed for, uh, an event called the Australian Prediction Project. We're gonna to try to do that every week. He's got about a thousand more to get through and it's really helpful whenever he has a group of people to talk it over with and we, we evaluate the claims. Tomorrow, I will at noon, um, a nice reminder to Linda Tremell, I will be having a talk with just Linda and Tremell tomorrow at noon. Uh, we're gonna be gossiping, no, I don't know. <laughs> We have a lot to talk about. So uh, join us tomorrow on just in the same format we're doing right now with About Time um, Project here. The event page is up there on About Time Project. Paula has just reminded me and also on the Susan Gerbeck page on Facebook. So that will be with Leonard Tremell at noon California time. And then at 7 uh, at 6.30, right, Janice, we have a talk. Yeah. Can yeah. You set that up. Uh, we're talking to um, Michael Burke, who was a reporter, a student reporter at Syracuse University, and he wrote for the Daily Orange, which is the newspaper there, and he did an expose on Syracuse University and facilitated communication and uh, did not hold back any punches. So um, it was quite, mm. a, quite a coup for the skeptic community and quite brave, I thought, for a student reporter to go against administration and teachers and stuff to, to um, really talk about what was going on. So he's gonna talk about his experience with FC and some of his thought processes. And I think it will be a really interesting conversation. Yeah, now that he's graduated. And <laughs> he's up, yeah. that was, yeah. I remember reading that at the time and we used it quite a bit on the facilitated communication with the Pedia page. But to hear it from an insider at the school and the, and the conflict that was going on between the, between the administrators and the professors who were people who were pro FC and people who were definitely not and totally embarrassed that the school was <laughs> this anti pseudoscience, the mm -hmm. pseudoscience. So that's on um, 6.30 California time, right? Yeah, which is 9.30 uh, my time in the evening, which is my bedtime, so. <laughs> so Janice will have a little pillow off to the side. <laughs> I might. And I'll be the only one wide awake. And on uh, Thursday, we have, um, Squaring the Strange podcast will be um, releasing a, a, a podcast I did talking about psychics. I recorded it a few weeks ago. It'll be released tomorrow. So if you listen to Squaring the Strange, that would be great. We also do trivia. If anybody's interested in coming and hanging out on Zoom trivia, uh, we have a lot of fun. That's on Thursday at 6.30 California time. And um, that's all I have right at the moment. We have a couple other talks coming up in the future. 
Oh, also don't forget that um, uh, Skeptical Inquirer has on Thursday, we'll be releasing another talk. That will be the Skeptical Inquirer Presents. And that is going to be about, oh gosh, I've got so many notes in here, I can't even read it. I think it's at four o'clock California time, as well as the UK skeptics do a talk online at 11. So Thursdays are kind of condensed, you know. So uh, there's a lot happening online if you guys are interested, but please, um, please subscribe to us on YouTube so that we can get more subscribers. And the last question from Wendy Hughes is, is there any skeptic group going after the colleges and teaching uh, facilitating communication? The answer is the group is called True Voices and Janice and I are, uh, that's our group. And yes, we have been going after them and it's, that's gonna be a whole nother episode, right Janice? Yeah, we need to, yeah, we need to talk about what can be done and where we need and, to push. And yeah, all the work that's been going on with that. It is a tough fight, Wendy. It really is because there's a lot of money involved. It has been uh, enlightening, let's say. So we will be talking about that in a future episode. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye. You, so, as usual, thank you, Janice. I really appreciate all the work. See you later. Bye, everybody. See you soon.